Hello everyone, today's lecture is on radiation detection and measurement. Let's look at the objectives for today. After today's lecture, students will be able to list the types of radiation detectors used in nuclear medicine. Students will be able to list the types of gas-filled chambers used in nuclear medicine, and also students will know about other non-imaging uses of radiation detectors and the QC for those radiation detectors. Radiation detectors can be classified based on their detection method or the detection output. Electrical detection involves converting the radiation to either voltage or current. When a scintillator is used, the radiation is converted first to light, then to voltage or current. Semiconductor detectors usually convert radiation signals to current. At the output of the detector, the signal can be displayed in several ways. Detectors displaying counts are called counters. Those displaying a spectrum are called spectrometers, and those displaying total energy are called dosimeters. Let's define a few detection parameters. The efficiency of a detector is also called sensitivity and is a measure of its ability to detect radiation. In the process of detecting energetic photons from radionuclide decays, we can obtain efficiency by placing a detector in the vicinity of the energetic photons and measuring the number of photons reaching the detector and then divide by the number of photons emitted. This is called geometric efficiency. Intrinsic efficiency is defined as the number of photons detected divided by the number of photons reaching the detector. The figure illustrates the concept of geometric efficiency. In the first image, geometric efficiency is lowest because radiation is emitted in a 360 degree direction, but only a small amount reaches the detector. In the second image, the geometric efficiency is close to 50% because the detector intercepts about half of the emitted radiation. In the last image, a well-typed geometry is used. In this arrangement, the detector intercepts more than 50% of the emitted radiation. We shall see this type of geometry when we learn about well counters later. Energy resolution is the ability to separate different energies from each other. When counting radionuclide decays, the photon or particle radiations from different radionuclides can have different energies. The ability to detect these energies and display them is what a spectrometer does. Detectors may be operated in pulse mode or current mode. In pulse mode, each signal is treated individually while in current mode, signals are averaged and treated as a current. When using a real radiation detector to measure counts from radionuclide decays, the ability to separate different counts is important. This is determined by a pulse resolving time or dead time. Dead time is a time required to count an event or signal. During the dead time, other pulses are not counted. The figure shows the plot of an ideal detector where the measured count rate is proportional to the true count rate for a detector operated in pulse mode and where dead time has no effect. Real radiation detectors can be characterized in terms of count rate capability as either non-paralyzable or paralyzable. The curves describing these two types of radiation detector models is shown on the graph. Non-paralyzable systems ignore signals or pulses during the dead time but will count signals or pulses outside the dead time. In high radioactivity environments, the measured count rate continues to increase but at a slower pace than the true count rate as the curve shows. For paralyzable systems operated in high radioactivity environments, signals or pulses are ignored during the dead time and any subsequent signal or pulse extends the dead time so the detector eventually stops counting. The measured count rate increases to a peak and then declines as the curve shows. Based on what we covered on the previous slides, we can learn about counting statistics. Because the decay of a radionuclide and its detection are random in nature, the measurements are subject to random error. Counting statistics allow us to judge the validity and accuracy of the measurements our detectors produce. When it comes to the decay of a radionuclide, as you watch the radionuclide, there are two possibilities. It may decay or it may not decay in a particular time. When the radionuclide decays, for different reasons, the detector may or may not count the decay. Because of the random nature of these binary outcomes, they can be described by a probability distribution function. There are three probability distributions relevant to these binary processes. These are the binomial distribution, the Gaussian distribution, and Poisson distributions. Based on this, we can now set up the detector so that we can be sure it is counting radionuclear decays correctly. Once decays are counted, we can obtain mean counts 
standard deviations of counts, the errors in counts, and so on. We can even determine if the counts are random by using the chi-squared analysis. Now let's talk about different types of detectors. We shall start with gas field detectors. Then we shall learn about scintillation detectors, semiconductor detectors, and some instruments using these types of detectors. A gas field detector is basically two charged electrodes in air. The electrodes are charged with a voltage depending on the region of operation. When the gas between the electrodes is ionized by radiation, ion pairs are formed. The positive ions are attracted to the negative electrode and the negative ions are attracted to the positive electrode. A current flows between the electrodes and is measured and converted to the amount of ionization in air. The figure shows a simplified gas field detector with positive and negative electrodes, power supply, and a meter for measuring the amount of radiation. A gas field detector can be operated in various response regions depending on the applied voltage between the electrodes. The voltage response curve shown on this slide illustrates the different regions of operation. We shall start with the recombination and ion chamber regions. When ion pairs are produced in a gas, if the applied voltage is not high enough, the ion pairs recombine. This region is called the recombination region. The recombination region is a small region shown on the curve. When the voltage is increased until the ions are no longer recombining, we enter a plateau region called the ion chamber region. In this region, the response of the chamber does not change significantly when voltage is applied between the electrodes. Ion chambers are operated in the ion chamber region shown on this curve. They are also operated in current mode and can be used in high radioactivity environments. The left image is an ion chamber with its internal parts shown. The next region after the ion chamber region is the proportional region. As the voltage is increased past the ion chamber region, the response begins to increase with voltage and we enter the proportional region, the nearly straight line region where response is proportional to both the voltage and to the energy deposited. In this region, ions have enough energy to cause additional ionizations in a phenomenon called gas amplification or Townsend effect. The amount of amplification increases as the voltage is increased. Proportional counters are usually operated in the proportional region in pulse mode and can be used as counters or spectrometers. Beyond the proportional region, we enter the region of limited proportionality as the voltage is increased further. The Geiger-Muller or GM region is beyond the region of limited proportionality. In this plateau region, there is an avalanche of ionization, which represents almost complete ionization of the counting gas near the anode. Because of this effect, any increase in voltage does not increase the response, and the response is independent of the radiation producing the response. GM counters are usually operated in pulse mode and are paralyzable unless measures are taken to avoid the effect. Beyond the GM plateau, atoms of counting gas near the anode may be ionized spontaneously if the voltage applied to the detector is raised. This region is referred to as the region of spontaneous or continuous discharge because the counting gas may be ionized even if there is no radiation entering the detector. Let's look at some examples of gas field instruments used in the nuclear medicine lab. The dose calibrator is a common instrument used in nuclear medicine. It is a well-typed gas field detector that works on the ion chamber principle. It is filled with pressurized argon gas to increase its efficiency. It can give accurate readings of radioactivity. The picture on this slide shows a dose calibrator behind leaded shielding. Let's look at the operating characteristics of the dose calibrator. Dose calibrators are accurate to about 2 curies but are not accurate at low activities like 1 microcuries. There is a syringe holder and a vial holder to permit reproducible geometries, and there is also a plastic insert to prevent contamination. Those calibrators cannot be used as spectrometers because they cannot distinguish different radionuclides. Because they have large wells, they are not affected significantly by sample size or volume. Those calibrator quality control is required by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The list of QC tests are shown on this slide. Linearity ensures the dose calibrator responds linearly to different activity levels. One way to perform dose calibrator linearity is to use the lead sleeves shown on this slide. Color-coded lead sleeves of different thicknesses use attenuation to simulate radioactive decay of a fixed amount of activity over time periods of up to 50 hours. 
Normally, linearity is done in the dose calibrator by using different activities covering the clinical range. A vial containing the maximal activity that is administered to patients is measured two or three times a day in the dose calibrator until it is below 30 microcuries. These measurements are compared to calculated activities by the dose calibrator. This is done at initial installation and quarterly thereafter. No measurements may differ from the corresponding calculated activity by more than 10%. Constancy is a test that is done daily to ensure the response of the calibrator is not changing daily. At least one sealed source, usually cobalt 57, is assayed and its measured activity, corrected for decay, must not differ for, from its measured activity on the date of the last accuracy test by more than 10%. The test for accuracy is done at initial installation and quarterly thereafter. This is done by assaying two or more sealed radioactive sources whose activities are known within 5%. Often cobalt-57 and cesium-137 are the two sources used. The measured activities must be within 10% of the actual activities. Geometry tests the response of the dose calibrator to different sized samples and different sample volumes. If volume effects are found to affect measurements by more than 10%, correction factors must be determined. It is done at initial installation and annually or any time the dose calibrator is moved. Another important gas field instrument is the survey meter. Two survey meters used in nuclear medicine are the GM detector and the so-called QTPI detector. The GM detector is operated in the GM region where there is gas multiplication due to the avalanche effect, so very little external amplification is needed. The GM detector is high efficiency because of the high applied voltage. It can detect energetic beta particles and conversion electrons. It is often used for room contamination surveys, personnel monitoring, and detecting low levels of radioactivity. It is operated in the pulse mode and acts as a paralyzable detector unless measures are taken to avoid the effect. The QTPI survey meter is used to monitor areas of high radioactivity. It is operated in the ion chamber region in current mode. A QTPI detector is shown on the top image and the GM detector is shown on the bottom image. The next type of detector we shall learn about is the scintillator. A scintillator is a material that emits visible light when struck by X-rays. The light intensity is very low and must be amplified and converted to an electrical signal before it can be used. Amplification and electrical conversion can be done in various ways, but in nuclear medicine devices, it is done by using a photomultiply tube. We shall learn about photomultiply tubes on a different slide. A scintillation detector is basically a scintillator coupled to an amplifier like a photomultiplier tube. The scintillator commonly used in nuclear medicine application is sodium iodide crystal doped with thallium. Cesium iodide doped with thallium can also be used. Other scintillators like lutetium autosilicate LSO, lutetium lithium autosilicate LYSO, and bismuth germanate BGO are used in PET applications. Most scintillator-based detectors in nuclear medicine are operated in pulse mode and act as paralyzable systems. Algorithms may be incorporated to account for dead time losses. This table shows some properties that are desirable in scintillators. For our purposes, we shall focus on sodium iodide. Sodium iodide is used in X-ray and gamma ray scintillation cameras. It has 100% conversion efficiency with a fast decay constant of 250 nanoseconds and low afterglow. Other properties for scintillators include having high densities and high atomic numbers. This translates to high attenuation coefficients for gamma rays. Emission light should be matched to the spectrum of the detector. I mentioned a few slides back that light produced by a scintillator is first amplified and converted to an electrical signal before it can be measured. This conversion is done by using a photomultiply tube or photodiode. We shall first learn about photomultiply tubes on this slide. A photomultiply tube has a semi-transparent photocathode that converts light to electrons. The electrons are accelerated by application of high voltages between electrodes called dynodes. The accelerated electrons are focused on an anode. The photocathode, dynode, and anode are in a vacuum enclosure as shown on this image. A photomultiplier tube has 
10 to 12 diodes and provides amplification factors of more than 10 million. Another device that converts light to electrical signals is the photodiode. We encountered photodiodes previously when we learned about digital X-ray detectors. In indirect digital X-ray detectors, amorphous silicon photodiodes were used in thin film transistor arrays with a cesium iodide scintillator to convert X-rays to light and electricity. Photodiodes are smaller in size than photomultipliers and can be built directly onto an X-ray detector chip as in an indirect digital detector. Most photodiodes do not amplify the signals, but if they are designed as avalanche photodiodes, they provide some amplification, but not as much as a photomultiplier. In nuclear medicine, scintillators are used in various non-imaging applications. There are scintillators used in thyroid probes and well counters. We shall learn first about thyroid probes on this slide. Thyroid probes are used to measure the uptake of iodine-131 or iodine-123 in the thyroid gland. The probe is shielded on all sides and collimated so it records activity coming from only one part of the patient. A diagram of a thyroid probe is shown. The probe has a sodium iodide crystal doped with thallium and is coupled to a photomultiplier tube and a preamplifier. The signals are sent to a counter for accumulation and display. The photograph shows a typical setup and measurement for a patient. The next instrument using a scintillator is the well counter. A well counter is commonly used to assay wipe test samples to detect radioactive contamination. It can also be used for clinical tests and radioimmunoassays. Well counters consist of a cylindrical sodium iodide crystal with a hole in the crystal for insertion of a sample. This configuration is geometrically efficient and allows the assay of samples as small as 1 nanocuries. As with the thyroid probe, the crystal is coupled to a photomultiplier tube and a preamplifier. The entire setup is placed in a thick lead shield as shown on the top image. The bottom image shows an automatic well counting system with multiple wells and a display. Both thyroid probes and well counters should have daily energy calibrations performed with the results recorded. Daily background counts and daily constancy tests are also performed using a long half-life source like cesium-137 to test for radioactive contamination or instrument malfunctions. The next type of detection material is a semiconductor. Semiconductors are crystalline materials that have electrical conductivities between that of metals and insulators. Metals conduct electricity because electrons in the metal are free to move in a part of the metal called the conduction band. In metals, there is an overlap between the conduction band and the valency band. Insulators do not conduct electricity because they have no electrons in the conduction band, and the conduction band is separated from the valency band by a wide band gap. In semiconductors, the band gap between the conduction band and the valency band is small, so electrons can be made to jump into the conduction band when they are energized. Examples of common semiconductors are silicon and germanium. Semiconductors are doped with materials called impurities that provide an excess of negative charges to make N-type or a depletion of negative charges to make holes or P-type semiconductors. When a silicon semiconductor crystal is doped with boron, it becomes a P-type semiconductor and when doped with phosphorus, it becomes an N-type semiconductor. This figure shows an artist's depiction of crystal structure and the position of impurities in the structure. A semiconductor diode is formed from joining a N-type and a P-type semiconductor to form a junction diode. Semiconductor diodes can be used to detect ionizing radiation. The charge produced at the junction is proportional to the energy of the ionizing photons, so they can be used as spectrometers. They have high energy resolution than gas and scintillation detectors but have lower quantum detection efficiency than scintillators like sodium iodide because of having lower atomic numbers. Recall that high atomic number Z is desirable of X-ray absorption. Germanium, either in pure form or doped with lithium, has a much higher atomic number than silicon. However, germanium has to be cooled to liquid nitrogen temperatures to achieve a 1 keV energy resolution. Other semiconductor materials like cadmium telluride and cadmium zinc telluride can be operated at room temperature and are used for detection of gamma rays of 100 keV 
because they have acceptable stopping power in that energy range. Cadmium telluride and cadmium zinc telluride are used in gamma ray probes and in small area gamma cameras. They are operated in pulse mode when used as counters or spectrometers. Let's finish up with a few questions. First question, which of these is a gas field detector? The choices are well counter, thyroid probe, dose calibrator, CZT. The correct choice is dose calibrator. Second question, which of these is not a scintillating material? The choices are sodium iodide doped with thallium, CZT, cesium iodide, LSO. The correct choice is CZT or cadmium zinc telluride. So this is the last slide. So thank you for watching this presentation.